Good morning, everyone. Just moving Lucy off to the right there to make space to load. How's everyone doing today? It's been a quilty sort of week, as you know, if you've been here for a couple of days. So I did finish yesterday's quilt. Are we going to show those pictures right off the bat, Dave, first? Okay. So my husband is the guy behind the scenes, if you haven't been here before, manning all the cameras. And I will say, too, we've had a couple gremlins with our cameras and wires this morning already. So just let us know if we lose the feed on one of them or whatever. I think we'll see it here. We've got three cameras going, three monitors going. We should be able to keep track of stuff. So Dave has put a picture up of the quilt that I was working on yesterday. That was a vintage quilt, partly hand pieced, partly machine pieced, um, dubious skill levels, let's say. So it was a bit of a challenge to quilt, but you guys got to see the real thing, right? You got to see for sure how I work around pleats and and you got to see what kind of my level of tolerance for imperfection is. Each of us has to sort of find our own. So that's a little close-up look of one of the leaves quilted points. Who needs points on their triangles? And in fact, it's a beautiful quilt anyways. So there is the whole thing. I have not yet washed it because I wanted to nab the photos this morning, but I, I will wash it. The fabric was quite dingy, and so it will benefit by a, a gentle wash cycle for sure. And then the last photo shows the binding. Maybe there's one more close-up. I'm not sure. Good morning from Jana. Jana, good morning to you. That's just another kind of close-up of the folds. You get to see the overall effect and texture of the quilting. And I used kind of a modified version of Angela Walter's hook and swirl pattern. You can certainly Google that. She's got a nice tutorial for that. So this is a picture that includes the backing. And one of the questions I asked yesterday was for suggestions for ideas for what to back it with. And I got kind of all the darker colors that were in it, dark green, blue, reddish brown, etc. And I did find some reddish brown in my studio that would have coordinated, but all the darker colors that I tried looked so garish against what is quite a blue background. So I ended up going with this kind of pale muslin-y looking print that has the reddish browns and the blues and a bit of the greens in it. I think it's pleasing. It Overall, it looked the best. I tried probably seven or eight different fabrics and that one was the best. So yeah, that quilt is all finished. And I'm kind of thinking, we're going to do another vintage one today actually. It's, it's a very different style, but another vintage one. So I'm thinking I'll finish these two and I'll probably throw them up on my website and or Etsy shop for sale. Just for the quilt tops cost me nothing, so I'll just try and get a little bit for my time and supplies that I put into them. And if someone would like to see one of these vintage quilts in person and have it for a lap quilt, watch out for that in the next few days. Okay, let's get on to today's project. I will grab the backing. Well, you know, there's there's the old wives tale, right? About people who ask for advice and don't take it. That would be me. But I was open to suggestions, but honestly, I was the only person here seeing it in person and judging the effect. So, had to go with what I judged was good. Yeah. Yeah, I I am a get or done person, for sure. It may or may not be perfect when it's done. However, those of you who were here yesterday saw that that quilt was not perfect to begin with, but I judged it to be worth finishing. Someone will have the joy of a lovely lap quilt, and I feel like I've honored the lady or ladies who pieced it originally. So that's a, that's a win in my book. That's success. So today's quilt, I had real difficulty finding a backing from my stash that I thought would be suitable. So I've ended up just using um, a muslin. In the end, I thought that was the most suitable. So there we go. Threads everywhere. Yeah, if you're, especially if you're new today, either way, but especially if you're new, would you let us know where you're tuning in from? I'm having a hard time getting that straight. There we go. As I think I've mentioned, the beauty of attaching the backing 
this way, as you see, I'm not finding the center of my quilt back or my leaders or anything like that. It's so quick and it pulls the fabric on straight. But of course it is on the quilter to get it coming straight over the rollers to begin with. And the way I judge it is this. If I have it skewed to one side or the other, if I see any kind of diagonal pulling lines, that's how I know that it's skewed. So I just try and get it, you know, adjusted so it's as straight and smooth as I can. And also the bit that's hanging over, I don't want that to be veering off to one side or the other. Even if it's a long quilt, I try and get it fed straight out over the rail. And then too, we get some steps in, trotting around the quilting machine. Get all the creases out. I do absolutely love this red snapper system. I have to say, in the interests of honesty, it would not be a good choice if you lack hand strength or if you have arthritis or something like that in your hands. It does take a fair amount of physical effort to put them on. But for me, since I don't have those particular difficulties, I love the speed of them. And just like that, we have a quilt backing. So someone messaged me overnight and asked if I would show how I judge the, the tautness, the tension on here. And I'll check it again after I've got the batting and the top on as well. But basically, I should be able to easily grab my fingers when I poke up from underneath. This is, you know, stretch taut. There's no sag to it, but there's no tension on it either. Um, when I, I don't know if you can hear, there's a snowblower going right outside our house this morning. I mentioned yesterday we were getting a down load of snow. We certainly did get that. Um, I would say we had, what, a little better than eight inches, Dave? And, um, I mentioned to you too on the show yesterday that there was a truck stuck on the slope right outside my window. Well, we had a front row seat all day. More people were stuck. I got to help someone push their car out. It's a very exciting day. And now at last you get to see our project for today. This one has stars. I'm wondering, I'm going to turn this the other way. Bear with me a second. Uh, all, all I said is that I love the speed of them, but they do take some hand strength to manipulate. And so they're probably not a good choice. If you, if you lack hand strength or if, or if arthritis troubles you, they're not the best choice. So I'll mention too, as you can see on this quilt, this side is not at all straight. There you go. Can you see that? I can't get it to stay up. So I did trim two edges straight and I'm going to make that my top and bottom. Um, that was just kind of a judgment call. The ends are so uneven it was hard to trim them. And also, can you see this? This is the corner of the quilt. I have decided in advance that I'm going to put round corners on this quilt instead of square ones because really another piece should have been set into the corner. Otherwise, I'm going to lose about three inches on each side. So I thought to myself, you know, I'm just going to quilt it, baste a straight edge on each side and angle across that corner. And then I'm going to get something round, a dinner plate or something, and I'm going to just curve those corners. And that will help me save 
quite a bit of width on the quilt. It's not a very big one to begin with, and I didn't want to lose, you know, five or six inches overall. So that's about as smooth as I can make it. This one is 100% hand pieced. I would say the lady who did it was somewhat skilled. The stitching is very, very neat. However, the edge of every single piece everywhere is bias. So it's extremely stretchy. So today I'm going to actually baste this quilt all the way down. And I don't know that I'll talk you through all of that, but I'll show you how I do that. And it's just a method of kind of controlling the stretch, keeping the quilt an even width, and knowing that I won't have any nasty surprises when I get to the bottom. I do still have a straight line of piecing, or more or less straight, to eyeball that this is even across my quilting machine. And one more tool I'll show you guys today. This is a long tape measure designed for quilters. It's, oh, probably 14 feet long. And um, I got mine online. I think the brand is Colonial. Um, it is it is made so that it has a center here, and then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, etc., out from the middle. So you could center something. I'll be 100% honest with you. I don't usually. I just, I know what my right-hand measurement is and what my left-hand measurement is. You know, so it's 56 and 21. And I keep my quilt on those all the way down. With this quilt, it is so inexact. I'm not going to try and match exactly. I usually try and be within an eighth of an inch. I'm just going to use it as a guideline. Because, yeah, yeah, no two diamonds are the same length on this quilt at all. But it's going to help me just a little in my guideline. And you can see I'm dealing with lots and lots of pleats and funky things again today. So once again, we'll be winging it. This is a reality quilting show. I wonder if NBC would buy that. Whoops, forgot I have no bobbin in there. Bear with me. Uh, yes, I do always float my top. Um, I think you probably get used to perhaps whatever way you do it. I have never rolled a top on my quilting machine. So even when I do show quilts and they might have two layers of batting, my answer is usually to baste it as I'm going to do today. You'll see me, I'm going to put basting lines um, horizontally, left to right, all the way down the quilt. And that's my answer to controlling the craziness. Goodness sakes, I have so many pleats in here today. This is going to be thrilling. Okay, this time I am going to put my vertical channel lock so now my machine cannot move from left to right so that I get a perfectly straight line up the side of this quilt. And I'm going to try and put a pleat right in that edge. I'm going to try to. It's not really working. Hang on a second. When all else fails, pin it in place. See if we can... Hmm. I'm having a heck of a time here. Okay, there's another solution. I'm going to go off the side and come around and stitch back the other way. A thread out of the way. All right, now I've got my pleat stitched down. I've put my vertical channel lock back in place. We should gauge the tension of our quilt. Once again, I'll do that for you one more time. So here I'm just going to wing it in terms of my, my basting line. It doesn't really matter because I'm going to be cutting, I'm going to be trimming it off afterwards anyway. I'm just going to get across that awkward corner as best I can. Get to the top. Um, so once again, let's look at our tension. You can see I can push my hand up from below. Dave's going to change the camera for a moment. I can push my hand up from below. I'm just putting my fingers straight up into the bottom of the quilt. I can grasp them fairly easily. I've got this one maybe even a little looser than I sometimes might because I know that this top is all bias and it is stretchy and I do not want to put tension on it because what will happen then is when I release it from the rails, it will curl up and do funny things because those fabrics will pull back into shape. So I'm keeping it a hair on the loose side. 
I was going to tell a story. When I bought my first Lucy 1.0, my first long arm machine, the lady that I bought it from had had it for a number of years and quilted lots of quilts on it. And she had one hanging on the wall for a reminder. She had put so much tension on the quilt that she actually tore the fabric. And I don't mean undid a seam, tore the fabric. I can't imagine. But I know even well before that, one of the things that will happen if you have too much tension is you will get skip stitches and you will get broken needles. And the faster you quilt, the more that will happen. So it does not do to have too much tension on your quilt. On the other hand, I've seen um, I've seen commercial quilters, you know, have have quilts loaded on their computerized their digital systems, and I've seen them kind of sagging in the middle. I can't imagine how they get a straight result from that, but I don't know. I've never done it, so I can't say for myself. But that does not seem to me that it would work well. This feels like a happy medium. Things are straight, things are smooth and even, but they're not stretched. So once again, I have my horizontal channel lock on, so I'm getting a straight edge on this side of the quilt. Now I'm taking the channel locks off and I'm just winging it across this corner because I'm going to trim it off later. And I will put my vertical lock on so that I get a straight line on this edge. And I don't think I've ever done a rounded corner on a quilt before, so I'm quite looking forward to this. I think it will be a fun little result. There's some more pleats coming. We're just letting them happen where they fall. I'm feeling like the tape measure might not even be helpful in this case because there's, you know, I can't even say, though it's at 27 on this point, you know, no two points are alike. So I think I'm going to just take it off and get it out of the way. But now you've gotten a look at one of my favorite tools when I do want to keep a quilt nice and straight. That is how I do it with that tape measure. And I just keep it clipped onto one end of my long arm and I loop the excess over when I'm not using it. Okay. Um, sure, I'll take a question. I have to take my glasses off to read the screen. It's not on the screen, hon. I'm seeing your link. I didn't have much time to search Angela Walter's video yesterday. Design of this quilt, I assume you mean? Oh, the design you stitched out yesterday. Yes, I'm... I'm almost 100% sure it's called the hook and swirl. So if you Google Angela Walters, try hook and swirl with her name. And if that fails, try hook, because I know that's in the name for sure. And what you saw is kind of my, my variation on it. Back to the glasses. Today, I'm going to quilt feathers, because um, I love feathers. Also because I'm picking designs that are not in my master class so that those of you who have already purchased that feel like you're still getting your money's worth out of it. And also because feathers are perennially popular. And I will mention too, um, I've done a couple webinars as an introduction to the master class. And in that webinar, I do a very detailed look at the feather and how to quilt it and how to move around your quilt. And I'm going to do another one we're aiming for the 9th of January, Saturday, the 9th of January. And I think it will be the same time as these episodes have been. So 9 a.m. PST in the morning. And it runs a little over an hour. So it's a really close look at quilting feathers. And that's what I'm going to be doing today. So here we go.
Once again today, I'm going to stick with my regulated quilting speed just because so often I'm going to have to be pausing. I know I am, you know, to tuck in little pleats or put a little tension on the fabric so it lays flat. Yep, it'll be a little bit of a fiddly job. I should mention too, um, one of the ways you can judge the age of a quilt is by the fibers that are in the fabric. And I don't, you know, I'm not testing them, right? I'm just judging them based on what I know about textiles. But I would say quite a few of the fibers in this quilt are not 100% cotton, which is really common before the 80s for sure, maybe even into the 80s. And it's not the end of the world. I know my mother was of that era. She used a lot of broadcloth, which is poly cotton in her quilts because it was so widely available in so many colors. Um, and I still use those quilts to this day. So I'm not being critical. I'm just saying there is all kinds of fabric content in this. Now, a lot of them are wovens and I don't really know what was used to make wovens. You can see this dark one that I'm going over. It is definitely a woven and it's very pretty. One of the temptations, I think, when you're quilting freehand like this is to avoid chunky seam allowances that can be difficult to sew over. And you see I'm coming right up to one here. So I'm going to tell you something I've learned by experience. For the purposes of the end result, it is best to quilt right over that seam allowance. If you quilt around it, again, when you release your quilt from the tension of the long arm, it's going to pop straight up. So best to, to deliberately quilt through those seam allowances, like this one, right through it. That will make it lay much flatter when the quilt is finished, or at least very close to it, to force it to lay down flat. There again, I made a small feather just so I could get as close as possible to that little seam allowance. Nail it down. This one's going to be tricky. I got it. So I know a number of you have been here all the days that I've been quilting, but just in case there's a few new people on here. Um, I wanted to do these live sessions of freehand and edge to edge quilting to introduce a masterclass that I'm launching in January. So when I talk about edge to edge quilting, that is what I'm demonstrating here. It has no relation to blocks. It does not stop for borders or for piecing. It is literally from one edge to the other of the quilt and sometimes called an all over design too. Same thing. That is the type of quilting I absolutely love to do. It's very economical for time, very little setup involved, no pre-marking involved, just lock and load. And because I quilt for clients, it is also very economical 
for money for them because my time is kept down. And I feel like a well-chosen design can add a whole lot of texture to a quilt top. And I, th in my opinion, that's what it's all about. I'm generally aiming for my quilting to be complementary, but not the star of the show in a quilt. Consequently, my thread choices are usually as neutral as I can make them. Um, in this quilt, I went quite light with the thread because I think that there's more of the background fabric. I'm not even 100% sure about that. Um, but in general, I tend to choose my thread sort of middle of the road. Darker than the lightest fabric in the quilt. Lighter than the darkest fabric. Does that make sense? I know some um, quilters will recommend that you pick the lightest tone that is in the quilt. That is certainly a way to do it. But what happens then is that when you go across the darker fabrics, that light thread really pops. And then when you're on the light fabrics, that quilting really disappears. So to me, the middle of the road choice is better for that unobtrusive look that I'm looking for. Um, I think the day before I started these live episodes, I put a little, oh, I don't know, four or five minute video on my Facebook page regarding my thread choices and my rationale behind the choices I make. So you're always welcome to check that out. And I use almost exclusively Isocord 50 weight, 100% polyester thread. I kind of fell into that because when I first began long arming, I found a lady on, I think, eBay that was retiring from long arming. And I bought a great big bundle of partially used spools from her. And that's what they were as Isocord. But my machine loved it. And I have since tried other threads and not found one that I like better. So one of the things I love about Isocord is an enormous range of colors. There's, oh, close to 350 different colors of thread. And I love having those choices at my fingertips. So this is my preferred thread. I do know for sure I do not care for cotton thread. So whatever brand I use, I guarantee you it's going to be a polyester one. Um, far, far less lint to deal with. When you're turning out, you know, sometimes several quilts in a day, that's, that's a thing. You cannot be vacuuming out your machine two and three and four times a day with an air compressor. That takes a lot of time. So I definitely go for the low lint thread. So what are you thinking of the feathers, ladies? Give me some feedback here. When I get across to the other side, we'll stop for a minute and have a look at the overhead camera and get a look at the texture.
Well, I'm definitely not catching all of these seam intersections in my quilting. There's just too many of them, but I am trying to catch the worst of them, the bulkiest ones. And quilt them into submission. Like that one coming up right there. See what we can do with him. And we're ready to advance. Got any interesting questions? Okay. Okay, one moment. Eileen, as a new Oliver Feller quilter, how do you determine your quilting path? Um, good question. And if you want in depth, come to the webinar. Even if you've been there once, come again. <laughs> and if you're on my email list, um, you'll get notifications of when that will be and probably on social media as well. Um, and if you have not done that yet, oh, this camera over here. Sorry, everyone. Um, if you have not signed up for my newsletter yet, I invite you to do so. Dave will probably put up a link, but for sure it's on the homepage of my website, stitchedbysusan.com. So in that webinar, I'll go into some depth of how I plan it. But in general, it's much like a meander in terms of shape. I'm very much moving that way across my quilt. Um, it varies a little bit depending on the scale of my feathers, whether I can do a whole, you know, across and return, or whether I just do one pass and then advance my quilt. It's, there's nothing clear cut about it. You can really play with that. This I've just found works well for me to keep track of where I'm going next. So. That's my short answer to that one. So once again, I've got gentle, very gentle tension on this. It's smooth and flat, but there's no, there's no pull on it at all. And you know what, ladies, I totally forgot. I totally forgot. I said I was going to base this quilt. And I think I am going to go and baste the rest of it now because I really don't want to get to the bottom and find that it's desperately skewed longer on one side than the other. So I'll give you a quick look at what my typical basting looks like. This is a two for one today, both quilting and basting. It is such a small quilt, I honestly wouldn't have to, but that gives you a look at, at what this is like. And certainly on a large quilt that had a lot of bias edges, I would do this, absolutely. So it involves the same format every time. I stitch down the left, which I'm going to do with my channel lock on. We're fixing the mic, there we go. And I'm just doing this with my quilting size of stitch. It could be larger, I don't bother changing it. There's no reason necessarily to change it. And once I get near the bottom of the pass that I could make on my quilt, which is going to be about here, now I put my vertical off, my horizontal lock on. So I'm locked into a straight line this way. You can freehand that too if you don't have the vertical lock. And this time I'm going to put it on a basting stitch, which is an inch long. If you don't have that on your machine, as I didn't on my last one, I literally just went across the quilt hitting one stitch at a time every inch or inch and a half. That works too. So I do put a couple stitches right here in the um, where I'm sitting at the edge so that when I get near to quilting on my basting line, I'm going to want to pull that basting thread out. And oftentimes from way in the middle, I'll just yank it out because they're loose stitches but I don't want to pull my perimeter basting out at the same time. So I kind of do a lock stitch at that corner. 
and then I'm just going to move across the quilt. And every so often my needle catches like that, so I kind of have to be aware. Yep, today's going to be the day. <laughs> okay, you're going to get to see the single stitch at a time. Because my needle keeps, um, when I pause, the needle is down just a little bit and it's picking up the fabric. I'm not sure what's going on there. So in most machines you can, that's an uh, um, electric impulse, if you will, that timing. And you can change how far up your needle comes. I don't know that I'm going to be able to base this, actually. I don't want to stop and do that kind of change for you today because it will take time. But I can adjust where my needle, the position it's in when it pauses. Because this is not good. Yeah, I think I'm going to give up on that. Sorry about that. But you've kind of got the gist of it. So I would stitch all the way across. I would go back to my smaller stitch length and baste up my usual basting up that side. Then I would advance my quilt and do the same U shape down the left, basting big stitches across and a tight baste up the right hand side. And then as I come to the basting line in my quilting, I will take that basting out. You don't want to be quilting over it and trying to undo it afterwards. That will be very, very difficult. So basting is just not to happen today. Once again, it's reality TV. These things happen when I'm quilting and you have to make decisions. If I weren't on camera, I would take the time to fish out my manual and determine how to do that. Um, like I said, I can adjust the length of, of time that the, you know, where the needle position is when it comes to a stop. And clearly I need to do that. Meantime, I will just yank those basting threads out and we'll proceed without them. Okay. Let's clip this side in place. So I'll just use my piecing as a guideline and Hope for the best, you know, keeping an eye on my bottom length and things like that will help. It's not going to be awful at the end. If it's off by half an inch, I can live with that. And I will say, when I'm doing, lest you think all I do is this sort of haphazard work, when I'm doing a quilt that I want to enter into a show or a client does, or I mean, even for most of my client work, I will use my vertical and horizontal channel locks to get a really nice, crisp, uh, straight perimeter and crisp corners. And generally, my quilts are within an eighth of an inch of square when they're finished. But when you're working with a top that is this inexact, that's just a recipe for pulling out your hair to try and make a perfect result out of a very imperfect top. So my thinking is, as you've seen, just get it done. I'm still on base. No wonder I'm having a hard time. Okay, here we go. I'm doing too much talking, not enough paying attention. But I'm so glad I decided to go with the rounded corners because as you can see, I'm still losing a certain amount of quilt in some areas. And so if I was cutting off those top and bottom corners, I would really be shorting myself. A lot of quilt but I had this point in mind I saw how short that was and I knew I had to keep within that width okay we're at the bottom and with feathers I feel like it's quite important to keep track of which side you are going from it's also easy to, to visually see I'm definitely going to alternate the directions of my passes to keep those feathers moving across my quilt top. So I'm just going to this last little one that I, I kind of curved right into the edge there and I'll be able to make that almost seamless. Not that it's really critical, it's gonna fall into the binding anyways, but.
So my goal in this funky place right here was to, you see how there's fullness inside that feather, but I didn't actually stitch in a pleat. So to me, that's the best possible result that I could get there. The fullness is taken up, but when this quilt, you know, is washed and used, that's not going to catch the eye as much as a pleat would. So I've avoided the pleat and I just used my other hand, my fingers to get that bulge of fabric in there. But a bulge is better than a pleat, in my opinion. I'm just going to stitch right over. Oh, someone from Bangladesh today. How awesome. So I'm just curious. Are you able to find the same types of long arm machines that we have in the U.S. or do you have other brands perhaps that we don't know about? Or do you quilt on your domestic machine? Or some other type of longer armed machine? I kind of avoided that pleat. Little pleat going on there, but we're gonna have to live with that one. I will say, as regards my quilt path, I hardly ever go in a straight line. So hardly ever just alternate left, right, left, right. I almost always have two lefts and then a right or more or three or four. So you can probably see that if you're watching while I'm quilting. I think the straight progression looks very awkward. So I aim to have it always curving this way and that.
we're going to catch this little bobble right here because otherwise that will forever be rising up out of the quilt. We don't want that to happen. Didn't do as well there. But you win some, you lose a couple. Were there more questions about the thread path that I kind of skimmed over? Okay, let's pause a minute. I'll get a sip of coffee. Oh boy. Um, in the past, I've gotten some off of eBay, vintage tops. Um, there we go. Now you can more or less see me. Um, in the past, I shouldn't be standing over my quilt with this. I don't generally do that. In the past, I've gotten some on eBay. They've gotten more popular, so they're harder to find and more expensive on eBay. So more often, I don't get them by plan. They just come my way. More and more people are learning that I like to do this type of work. Also, the quilt guild, the machine quilting guild that I'm in, and I mentioned this yesterday, we have one in, in our city of Spokane, and it's quite active. And for the last five or six years, they've had a challenge each year, which has to do with a vintage top or vintage pieces. And at the end of the year, then in our quilt show in our city, those would all be shown and they would be judged and there was prizes. Um, we've also taken them to a couple of neighboring cities who have seen our quilts and wanted to show them in their quilt show. So we've kind of been a traveling exhibit. So I've done that a few years too. So now that it's kind of getting around that, we as a group and I personally really love to do this kind of quilt tops. I'll occasionally just have a friend say, you know, I've got my grandmother's top and I don't want it and I don't know what to do with it. Here you go. I've had probably four or five given to me that way. And sometimes I just get lucky. Um, earlier this summer, the quilt that I, the backing that I used yesterday, I mentioned that it was um, a flat sheet. I just happened upon a garage sale and it was really a crafty sale. And she travels all over to people's, you know, estate sales and garage sales and collects all this stuff and then resells it. So it wasn't quite as inexpensive as a garage sale price, but very nearly. So those flat sheets, I paid $2 a piece for. And I think I came away with six or eight of them for backings. Can't lose. And the custom quilt that I was mentioning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a live uh, series of episodes like this for that custom quilt. That's a Lone Star, which I got at that same stale sale. And so it was just the star, right? It was not applique onto anything. You have to be pretty aware they're apt to come in very rough shape. So go in with your eyes wide open in terms of what to assess, like what's fixable, what's usable, and what might be a deal breaker. And then be prepared to put a little extra work into it, pressing it, cleaning it, repairing it, that sort of thing. But they're out there. Okay, another question? Jody, I was taught to base the sides from the bottom up to keep the top from creeping down. 
I see you go back and forth between basting up and basting down the sides. And now I'm curious, is the creeping really a concern? To me, to keep the top from creeping down. To me, it's not, Jody. My left hand is always either pulling a little tension on my fabric or pushing, you know, if I need to make any adjustments there. So again, I didn't know any different and I just began doing it that way. And so I've continued doing it that way. It doesn't seem to bother me. I do think if you just start stitching at the top and stitch to the bottom, it will push down. But I did demonstrate that. I'm usually pulling my fabric a little bit from behind my hopper foot, easing that in. And if, you know, if you're aware and watching your straight line here, you'll, you'll see when that's happening and be able to prevent it, I feel like. One more sip of coffee and then I'll quilt again. I can take another question. Yep. Okay, Sheila. Sometimes it seems you avoid the puckers and sometimes mush them down. Is there a particular reason for each choice? Oh, not vastly. I'm trying to hit the biggest seams and stitch them down. When I think I can, I'll try and ease out a pucker. When it doesn't seem possible, I just stitch it in. But you know, you're going at some speed, so you kind of make those decisions on the fly. Eileen, I love the control you have as you tame those bulky seams. That's one of the difficulties I have with pantograph. I can imagine that would be true. I'm not a pantograph stitcher, but yeah, when you're on the opposite side of the machine and you can't reach it, um, that would certainly be difficult. And that is one of the things I love about freehanding is you do have ultimate control. So whether it's a seam that is too bulky to stitch over or whether you have to turn your automation off and, and, and turn your flywheel and go through it one stitch at a time. You know, all those things. You're right there. You're right in control and you can do whatever you need to do to make it work. So that's one of the reasons I love freehand stitching. Okay, here we go. Another pass. We have room for another one in here before I advance. Now I'm going to make a funky decision here. I didn't see that. I had not stitched this seam allowance down and I've got a big feather in front. I'm still going to go in there. I think that will look less awkward than leaving it loose. And that's not a right or wrong decision. That's just a personal opinion decision. It would have been fine done the other way too, I'm sure. Okay, once again, I got to run for a tissue, ladies. Yesterday, you notice I didn't blow, I just dabbed. Okay. okay, we're back in business. Have I mentioned I love quilting? <laughs> I just didn't know if I'd said that at any point. I suspect that probably shows. I'm so grateful to actually have a job that is what I love to do. Let's see if we can't sew that one down. Pretty good. And now we'll just get that bulk in there, but we didn't actually make a pleat out of it. I'm satisfied.
Here again, we're gonna try and make our bubble, but no pleat. This design is definitely another example of using curves to do some of your work for you. There's something about the motion of going around and back in that kind of pulls in excess fabric. So that really affects my choice of design for this quilt. Um, it was definitely going to be something all curves, even though it could have been a more masculine quilt quite easily. And one of my favorite things to quilt is parallel horizontal lines just all horizontal lines i think it makes amazing texture on a quilt however i would not attempt it on a quilt like this it would just serve to emphasize all the irregularities all the puckers all the odd places because it's so sleek and contemporary so think about that when you're choosing your design especially if your quilt has challenges built into it as this one does Use a design that will help you, not frustrate you. to get some pleats going on here. There's a lot of fabric there going on. I don't know if you can see in the camera here. Yeah, you can see this hand. I'm There's a lot of excess in here, and I'm actually pulling and pulling the fabric taut kind of over the arm of my machine. That helps to distribute that fullness evenly. And as you can see, I managed so far to do that without a pleat. That's another kind of tip that helps. Some quilters call that the bean can technique. If you've never seen that one at work, it's kind of neat. If you've got a whole quilt that's got fullness like that that needs easing in, you can actually put some type of canned goods on both sides of your... I'm not even sure what the term is for this, the bar of your machine. And just that little bit of tension will help it um, distribute the fullness. And if you put your cans this away, they will roll as you are quilting. At least the one in front of you will roll out of your way. And just that little bit of pressure can make all the world of difference. So that is a really low-tech fix, but I encourage you to give it a try. It, it really works. And so I was doing exactly the same thing, just on a smaller scale with my fingertips. And it certainly does not need to be a can of beans. That just, whoever first coined that phrase just thought it sounded funnier, I'm sure. Here we are at the edge again. Um, uh, I'll do them now. Quilt design to do. Oh boy. <sighs> you know, it changes from time to time, but at this moment, it is feathers. These all over feathers. Margie, I have some vintage tops from great-grandparents would love to quilt, but kind of terrified. Well, I'll give you another tip, Margie, depending on how detailed you want to go. What you guys are seeing here yesterday and today is, is quite casual treatment of vintage tops. 
because these tops I don't think ever were intended to be heirlooms or treasures, but I have done some that were or that I wanted to make into such a treasure. So I have a class that I offer called Treasure Hunt. And number one, I've done it in some um, online quilt shows. Am I in either camera, Dave? Okay, being straight on, because I'll talk about this for 30 seconds. So I offer this class called Treasure Hunt, in which I talk a whole bunch about, you know, assessing the top for damage, for tears, ways to clean it, ways to mend it, types of fibers of batting or thread to use, you know, to add to it. Lots of quilting ideas and lots of pictures from the Machine Guild um, competition that I've been in over the years. So that class is called Treasure Hunt. I offer it in online shows and it also is listed on my website under classes so that if you had a guild or a group of people, because obviously everything's online now, right? So if you knew of a group of people that wanted to do that, I would host that class. So it's lecture style. There's notes that come with it and places for you to add in notes as we go through and it's about an hour and a half long. So it's all about everything I have learned over the years of working with vintage fabrics and tops and pieces. Some of the quilts I've done have not been an entire top. They've been pieces. And then I've added my own design and my own fabrics to them to create a finished product. So yeah. This is where Jody, I just use my other hand to either push up excess or pull it from behind just to keep my front edge on the level, so to speak. There are so, so very many things in quilting that are, you know, a matter of personal opinion or experience or what you get used to. I just would hesitate to say that there's a wrong way. I think you should try different ways. The red snappers are a good example. Some people love them, some people hate them. So, you know, it's what works for you. Some people base their quilts horizontally and vertically before they begin custom quilting. I have never done that. I have always thought that's way too time consuming for me. However, for some people, it's worth the time. So experiment. Right at the edge of this one. Right at the edge. Again, with my strapping on the side, I'll just move Lucy out of the way so you can see it a little bit. This is the end for which I don't have a bar. It's broken, so I've just got two separate clamps. I'm careful not to pull those too tight because the quilt is biased and could easily stretch. And then I'm going to get a funky shape, you know, on the side there. And I don't want that. So I, I've got it, you know, just so it's pulled flat, but there's no curve in my stitching line. It's not pulled taut, if that makes sense. And you may have noticed that I'm starting stitching from the right hand side each time, but in fact, I'm doing, you know, a U curve to get back here. So I'm still alternating the direction of quilting my feathers. So after this pass, there's just a few more inches. So it's a small quilt. See how we're going to ease that in. Not too bad.
Add a bobbin thread. <laughs> Nobody likes a crowd and loud. I'm not the only one there. Nice. Well, you know, there's room for all of them. And of course, I wasn't meaning particularly this year because I don't know of anybody that's having a loud and crowd one today. But. Good. Good. So nice little cross section, but a lot of you, it sounds like, are kind of hobby quilters, which is lovely. Okay, I was just waiting for my bobbin to finish loading because I forgot to begin it when I grabbed the other one. Well, I'm not a sandy beach person, mostly because the sandy beaches usually come with a bajillion people, and that's not really my happy place. However, I do love sun, a lot of sun. Winter wonderland with sun. Well, you know, I enjoy winter. I enjoy snowfall. I used to more enjoy winter sports, but I absolutely love the heat of summer. Love it, love it, love it. Do you like hiking? Which, honestly, you can do in either a winter wonderland or the heat of summer. One of the things that I know you cannot see on camera is developing your peripheral vision. <laughs> that is not a good look. What are we going to do there? We're going to put a tiny echo inside that feather. I don't know if that was an improvement or not, but that's what we did. Anyway, what you cannot see on camera is that I am constantly, I'll just demonstrate for a sec here and hold still. My eyes, though they're on where I'm stitching, I'm always glancing ahead to where my last line of stitching was and to how much more I think I can fit in. So, th you know, before I did this last feather, I already determined I could do that one and then fit an upwards facing one in. Does that make sense? So I'm always glancing, glancing, glancing ahead in terms of arranging my space and using my space fully. I don't think there's a secret to that one. I think that just comes with practice. But it's good to know that that is something that you want to focus on because that really helps. So you don't, you know, lay one feather down and then all of a sudden say, oh, shucks, there's no room to fit one in above that. You're trying to avoid that. So here I've already looked above and I know I need to be able to make one row of feathers to work my way back out of here. So that's what I'm going to do next. And I find I have plenty of room, so I'll drop one in sideways. And that's how I do it. I'm just constantly making that adjustment.
There again, I'm going to put a little echo in there. I just feel like if that point is left loose, it's going to annoy me forever. If I had thought of it sooner, I would have sprinkled more of them throughout the quilt. So I will continue to do that now as I'm finishing up the quilt. Because that, being repeated, makes it a design choice, not an oops. So now that I've done two, I'm going to make a point of doing more of those as I finish up the quilt. Again, just putting some tension on my fabric in as many directions as I have fingers to manage. Helps to work in that fullness. a little echo again.
Sometimes this is how new designs come to be for me. I don't know if that little echo interspersed among the feathers will be a keeper or not. But I'll think on it for a while, look at my quilts a few times, decide if I like that. And that may be something I incorporate more, or it may be something I decide, no, nope, don't really care for that. Won't do that again. Either way, it's all good, but you don't know unless you try. Whoops. My machine is so funny sometimes. It, uh, if I push my button off and move my machine too quickly, the computer does not, <sighs> does not communicate. Give me a moment here. There we go. It certainly has been effective for this quilt, though, for all those little bubbles that I'm trying to pin down. Yeah, not very beautiful, but it'll do. I just did not see a better way around that one. Threads out. Pleats in here too. There's just no avoiding it. I think I did mention early on. Whoever did the hand stitching of this quilt did do a very nice job. Seen from the back, the stitches are beautifully even and neat. She's got better handwork skills than I have, and that's a fact. And here we are. I'm ready. I 
Colleen. I like a winter wonderland from inside my warm house by the fire. Too true. Used to love hiking, but my knees don't like it so much anymore. Yep, a f nothing like a fire. Oh, Donna. Hi, Donna. Donna and I used to be neighbors once upon a time. We lived about three houses apart. <laughs> Susan the Quilt Whisperer. Once again, you take a nice quilt top and make it stunning. You really are amazing. By the way, my son, son-in-law, their wives, and all the family. Dave's going to bring the comment back up for me. Cried when the two quilts of valor were opened. Aww. That makes me happy. It made for a precious memory and a moment of joy. Thank you for your part in making my quilt tops into heirlooms. You are so welcome. So I recently quilted a couple of quilts of valor for, as you see in the post, Donna's son and son-in-law. And I actually, I should post some pictures of them. I waited because I knew they were Christmas presents and I didn't want to jump the gun and put anything on social media. But I will do that in the near future. Okay, you can see my straight-ish edge. Uh, I can't really move Lucy out of the way. You'll see as I quilt, this front edge is, um, okay, Dave's going to show it on that camera. There we go. This front edge, because it's all bias, is super, super, super wavy. So I am going to go in and pin that, and my batting is just long enough. But I'm going to drop a bunch of pins in that to try and distribute that excess fabric as best I can. I don't think I'll be able to avoid some pleats here and there. I'll try and sort of hide them in the seam allowances, but all you can do is your best. There are inches of extra fabric here. And again, remember, I'm planning on making rounded corners. So I'm going to stitch, you know, my, my vertical and horizontal lines as far as I can. And then just wing it across that corner because it is going to get trimmed off eventually. So there you go. That, that will all, you know, even in there, more or less. Just going to check that my line is pretty straight. I think so. When in doubt, pin. Takes way less time to pin it in place beforehand than to stitch it down and not be happy with the results and have to unstitch it and redo it. So it's worth spending two minutes pinning. Here's some real excess. I doubt that you can see that exactly on the camera. I'm just going to actually put a fold in the in the seam allowance and just take care of it that way. You'll probably see it as I stitch across it. All right. I think I will put my horizontal lock on. I do want a nice straight edge across this bottom. I'm going to also make my stitches a bit larger. I think that'll make it just a little easier to catch in that excess fabric, perhaps. And I may, in fact, I'm going to. I'm going to stop and start again at the other side, only because it's backwards for me to be manipulating the fabric with my left hand. And once again, it's worth the two seconds it takes to change that out. And it'll be much easier to have my, you know, left hand working on the left side. That's just a matter of preference. If you did it the other way around and your right hand was manipulating, you might want to change that. So that's the only reasoning behind changing sides for me right now. Okay. Donna's letting me know it's okay to post pictures of the quilts. So that's good to know. I just did not want to jump the gun. They were, by the way, amazing quilts. So if you get a chance, check them out. Donna began them from panels and then really embellished them. And I'm going to move my channel lock up because I'm too far down. Once again, I'm adjusting on the fly. That's my superpower. So you can see here, I am 
really having to pull from behind my hopper foot. So I'm trying to pull that fabric under the hopper foot as best I can. But every edge along this perimeter of the quilt is on the bias, every single one. So they're just stretching like crazy. So now I'm trying another method, which is to put my fingers in front of it very carefully and literally push that fabric under. And I do stitch across my pins. Ask any two quilters and you'll have three opinions about that. But I find that if I'm going slowly, as I obviously am right now, I have never broken a pin or a needle. Knock, knock on wood. And I'm just forcing that excess fabric under there, but it hasn't done too badly for pleats. I'm just going to redo these and pull them down a little bit further. I can manipulate this quite a lot just because it is on the bias. I'm going to undo a few of these first basting stitches that I had. Bear with me a second. Okay. Fix that just a little. So I'm just pulling that fabric toward me a little bit and then just mashing it under the needle. So the hopper foot does want to push it out in front and I'm just not letting it do that. And there was a little pleat. In the scheme of things, I think that's pretty good. This was the seam allowance. There's a big old pleat under that seam allowance, which you can't see. But I thought that was the best way to take up that excess there. There we go. And we've met the corner. Pull all the pins out. Put some tension on the fabric. I'm going to catch the nose again. I don't want to be sniffing into the microphone continually. Kathy's asking, do you leave the basting stitches in when you bind the edge? Yes, I do. And I kind of deliberately, uh, you can't see it as much on this one because the edges aren't straight, but I quite deliberately make my um, basting stitches fall well with, uh, I'm right out of it again, <laughs> fall well within the quarter inch so that when I sew a quarter inch seam allowance on my binding, it will all be hidden. And yes, I leave them in. I figure that's reinforcement, which is a good thing and not a bad one. I'm going to be starting from this end. And for the one or two of you that do um, quilt for clients, that is one of the services that I offer. I have a secondary, really it's a storage room, but just an empty room um, just off my studio. And so I have tables set up in there and, and a rotary cutter and mat. And I offer to trim quilts for my clients. So you know, this edge here, I would offer to trim that, you know, to within a quarter inch of the of the stitching so that it goes back to them at home, just ready to put the binding on. It's all straight and trimmed. And then I just give them back their their fabric scraps. And if indeed there's any batting scraps and they've purchased that, I do give it, that back to them as well. So that's just a little complimentary service that I offer. No charge for that. My bobbin thread is just catching, so it's obviously caught in the mechanism below. One moment. And I rethread that. And now I have to put my stretcher back on straight. This is definitely my first choice of stretcher for the side, is one that is as long as you can get between, you know, the expanse of your quilting area. Because obviously it puts even tension all the way across your quilt edge as opposed to individual clamps pulling skinny little areas. So whatever kind, doesn't matter to me what brand, whatever kind you can find, these are what came with my, this style with my red snapper um, grippers. So that's what I am used to. But I don't think the brand matters just so long as it grips. Oh look, I've still got my big stitch on. There we go.
And here comes our little echo again. Now I do kind of have to make a decision here. I've got about 10 to 12 inches of space between my last pass of quilting and the edge of my quilt. I think it would be fairly awkward to try and cover that all in one pass. So I'm going to make the decision to do two fairly skinny passes. Again, no wrong way. You just decide which way you want to do it and go with it. a good choice right here I've got an area that's more than 12 inches already so it's definitely the right choice in this case going faster. I see the finish line. Once again, I'll give a huge shout out to my husband who not only sets up all these cameras and cables and so forth, but actually sits here the whole time that I'm quilting and kind of monitors your questions and types in the polls and all those sorts of things. So a big, big thank you to him for making this possible. This is not only not a one person show, but it's not really a Susan show. None of those things are my strong suit. So I really appreciate his help. Well, I hope these days of quilting together have really inspired you to take the bull by the horns, so to speak and dive in to some freehand edge-to-edge -edge quilting. It is so satisfying, and I hope I've been able to take some of the hurdles out of it for you, address some of your hesitations. We won't call them fears. They're not quite that severe, but some of the things you're nervous about. Hopefully I've been able to answer some of those questions. And I would absolutely love to see photos of what you do. I would just love it. So yeah, on any of the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, just tag me and then it will um, be sure to alert me when you've made a post. Stitched by Susan is what I am across all those platforms. Another little double. So for those little echoes, I haven't been counting, but what have we got? Eight or ten of them throughout the bottom end of this quilt now? I feel like that's enough to say it's a design choice. I'll maybe get a couple more in yet before we're done. Yeah, here's a good chance right here. We'll stitch it. We'll echo it. We'll stitch that right down. Yeah, so if you're interested in my master class, lots of information on my website. There's a page dedicated to the freehand master class. It's got the full um, curriculum, what's coming in every module, what you can expect, what your sort of expectations of 
learning outcomes might be, that sort of thing. If you have any further questions, reach out to me. You know where I am now. I do really hope, though, that this has been helpful for you just to kind of see the bird's eye view of what a project looks like from end to end. And I think I will make plans to do my custom quilt. Um, hopefully that will be next week already. So again, I'll post notifications. And I'll probably try and do it the same type of time of day. And then you know when to look for it. Um, and it will be a multi-day session too. I definitely will not accomplish that quilt in one day. And just to show that you don't have to do what's expected and end in the corner of the quilt, I'm not going to. As you see, I've already quilted the corner. More little echo. Oh, I forgot, you guys. We've got a whole nother pass here yet. Of course I'm not as ending in the corner of the quilt. I'm not at the end yet. Somehow I had in my head that was my last corner. So I showed you with one of the other designs, two ways to kind of deal with this, you know, coming up against the edge, either make smaller motifs as I've done there, or another way is to pretend like the edge isn't there and literally, you know, go right off the edge with your design and then come back in as though you were completing a feather that extended beyond. Either way is perfectly acceptable, in my opinion. You can see there how stitching right through the center of that seam allowance is really the only solution there. Otherwise, you will forever have a bulge or a pucker.
And even then, you've got a couple of choices for that. You can either stitch all the way off, you know, the shape of the feather, stitch the whole thing in, and then just trim the stitching off. Uh, if you have a hard time visualizing it, you could draw the actual feather in place there. Whatever works for you. If you want to keep it looking like a continuous design. Leave myself just enough room to sneak out up there. Lock my thread, and we're finished. Oh, my computer, of course, has to act up on the last stitch, silly thing. Okay, I'm ready for questions. I'm just going to unload. Sheila, do your relatively short up and down runs of feathers show better as the design than if you were to make them longer runs? Um, in my opinion, yes. If I make longer runs, I end up tending to get straighter runs of feathers because I'm trying to cover distance. So I'm trying to always be turning corners, as I mentioned earlier. So that's my personal preference. By all means, experiment with it and see what works for you. Um, in the webinar, if you should come to that, I show a photograph of one of my earlier all over feather quilt projects. And you can see how far I've come and you can see the changes that I've made that have to do with how I move around the quilt. And that's one of the changes that I made. But you feel free to experiment and see what works for you and get your own style of feather going on. Uh, one second here. Okay, the great unveiling. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the class, I'm thinking I will bind this quilt. And I already did the one yesterday. I'm going to give that one a, a gentle wash. Um, and I think that I'm going to list both of these on my website for sale. So if you're interested in a little lap quilt, really all I want out of them is a bit of something for my time and the materials I put into them. I didn't purchase either top. Just drop that and let's have a look and this one is about 50 inches and it's pretty close to square so it might be 50 by 55 you see that it's just got the muslin backing I didn't put out there as a question what shall I bind this one with oh yeah Dave's gonna zoom in on it a little bit so you can see it a little more it's gonna cover me up this is a very, very pretty little quilt. Very pretty. So I'm going to find something dark-ish, I think, to bind it in. A bit of a contrast. Maybe a nice teal, like this star. Something like that. Anyway, I'll work on that project tonight. I'll post photographs. Thank you who have been here all these four days. It's been really fun quilting with you. We'll do it again sometime. And a very happy new year to all of you. See you next time.